In the fall, 46 years ago, I took my parents for a camp out at Arches National Park. The morning after our arrival, my transmission failed, and we drove back to Salt Lake City in first gear. After the repair, we ventured out again. When we reached Moab, it was snowing. We continued south, thinking that if we went south far enough, we would find the sun. When we came upon the town of Bluff, we were in blizzard conditions. We found lodging in Bluff, and that night I first learned of the San Juan Mission and my great-grandparents, James and Sarah Riley's role in it. Since then, I have been drawn to the trail and the stories of the San Juan pioneers. There is something about walking where these pioneers walked, seeing the evidence of their labors and what they overcame, that is very awe-inspiring. No photograph, video, or description can come close to conveying the challenges these pioneers faced. In the fall of 1879, approximately 250 men, women, and children headed toward the San Juan River in the southeastern corner of the Utah Territory. Some volunteered to go for a homesteading opportunity. Others, including some who were not members of their faith, came along as a means of getting to Colorado, New Mexico, or Arizona. Most were responding to a call from their church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, to establish a settlement in the uncolonized portion of the territory. Their assignment became known as the San Juan Mission. Some of the participants were recent immigrants from European and Scandinavian countries who were still getting adjusted to life in America. Others were seasoned pioneers who previously endured great trials when they crossed the plains to reach Utah decades earlier. Most of the participants were young couples who had grown up in the Utah Territory. There were 106 children under the age of 13. Of those, 27 were under the age of 2. Some of the women were expectant mothers who were hoping to have shelter over their heads in the new frontier before giving birth. Many of the families were related to each other and were making the San Juan Mission a family undertaking. There were five Decker families, four Robb families, and three Dutton families. The Taylors, Seavies, Goddards, and Reds were all related to each other. Fourteen other families had relatives on the trek. Coming from numerous towns in the central and southwestern portion of the territory, the participants made their way toward Escalante, the last established town along their way. From Escalante, they began blazing the road toward the Colorado River Gorge. Three weeks into their journey, the pioneers reached 40 Mile Spring. They were now just 20 miles from the Colorado River. In reaching 40 Mile Spring, they were halfway to their destination. However, the feasibility of continuing was in question. Silas S. Smith, the leader of the expedition, sent his assistant, Platt D. Lyman, and 12 others to explore the terrain ahead. One of these scouts was my great-grandfather. After exploring for 10 days, the scouts reported their findings. They described the challenges associated with the Colorado River Gorge. The scouts had examined a crevice in the wall of the Colorado River Gorge called the Hole in the Rock. To access the river, this crevice would have to be turned into a wagon road. It had a sheer 40-foot drop-off at the top. In places, the crevice walls were too narrow to allow passage of a wagon, and the steepness of the descent was very forbidding. The scout's most alarming find was the terrain east of the river. The only way out of the river gorge was through Cottonwood Canyon, which was boxed in by solid sandstone cliffs. 
From the top of the river gorge, some of the scouts explored the possibility of going up the banks of the San Juan River, while four other scouts ventured east for several miles, where they found nothing but similar terrain. Platt D. Lyman, quote, The country is almost entirely solid sand rock. High hills and mountains cut all to pieces by deep gulches, which are in many places altogether impassable. It is certainly the worst country I ever saw. Some of our company are of the opinion that a road could be made if plenty of money was furnished, but most of us are satisfied that there is no use of this company undertaking to get to the San Juan this way. Before the San Juan pioneers left their hometowns, a southern route had been explored, which crossed the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry and cut through the Navajo Nation. Sites for the settlement had been located, and a northern route along the Old Spanish Trail had been explored. Two years earlier, James Brown had met with the Navajos to discuss a possible settlement in the region. The Navajo leaders, including Chief Bastine, welcomed the Mormons as neighbors and encouraged road building, but made it clear that they would not be able to use their springs. It was one thing to bring scouts through the Navajo Nation, but bringing a large company with hundreds of animals was out of the question. The northern route was 560 miles long, had two major river crossings, and areas with insufficient grazing. There simply were no easy routes to the southeastern section of the territory. Had there been one, the area would have been settled years earlier. In a church conference in Parowan, one month before their departure, the participants were informed that they would be taking the northern Salina route. It was likely at this conference that the leaders of the mission learned of the potential more direct route east of Escalante. Two weeks later, Silas S. Smith posted the following in the Deseret newspaper. Going to San Juan. The intention of the company to take the route through Salina Pass has changed. The reasons are the scarcity of feed along the way, and the new road across the Colorado River will shorten the distance by 200 miles. Their chosen more direct route had been explored at least up to the Colorado River, where river currents and beaches were found suitable to support a ferry operation. However, with their homes sold and winter approaching, the colonizers had to embark before this route could be fully explored. In choosing the Escalante route, they expected some difficulties descending into the Colorado River Gorge, but they did not anticipate such broken terrain east of the river. How far beyond the Colorado River had anyone explored, if at all, is unclear. The company clerk, Charles Walton, recorded the following summary of the scout's findings as follows. A bird could not fly over the route. It looks impossible to take a team over it. The San Juan pioneers faced dilemmas far beyond the challenges the scouts had just reported on. These include 90 miles had yet to be explored. What if there was even a worst obstacle or one that absolutely could not be overcome? The ferry and the river crossing. Other ferries operating the Colorado River, such as Lee's Ferry, had steel cables to prevent the ferry from being swept downstream. Here there would be no cable. Could they row a large ferry weighing several tons across the 350-foot-wide river and reach the landing area on the other side before being swept too far downstream? Would the ferry be stable enough to accommodate its intended two wagons, two teams, and two families? Successfully crossing the river hinged on Charles Hall's ferry design 
and his river flow calculations. Blasting powder and tools. Without them, they would be going nowhere. Money was very tight in the church and in the state coffers. Could sufficient funds be appropriated for the necessary tools and blasting powder? Could enough blasting powder be located in the territory, along with the experienced blasters who would be willing to go and assist? Snow depths were accumulating on the Escalante Mountain. By the time large quantities of blasting powder were obtained, could it be brought over the mountain? If not, it would also mean that they could not go back, and they would be stranded. Would their food supply hold out? Most were prepared for a journey of six weeks. How could they survive in a wilderness for another three or four months? Any one of these issues posed a potential disaster. There was more at stake than their mission. Their lives were on the line. It was too late to take another route. Their choice was to go on or return and abandon the mission, at least for this year with this group of people. If they returned, what would they go home to? Many had sold their homes and farms. There was one major advantage of this route, and that was the proximity of the small town of Escalante and its people and resources. There was timber in the Escalante Mountains, a sawmill, and the manpower and expertise to construct a ferry. Yet how could they go on? Winter would soon be upon them. For the expectant mothers, going on would mean that they would give birth on the trail under winter conditions. If any group had cause to abandon their mission, it was the San Juan Pioneers. The morning following the scout's report, Platt D. Lyman recorded in his journal, quote, Brother Smith called a meeting of the whole camp to take an expression of their feelings. It was unanimously resolved to go to work on the road. They spontaneously began to sing the hymn, The Spirit of God Like a Fire is Burned. It was in this camp meeting that Jens Nilsson, the company chaplain, made his famous statements. Four scouts were immediately sent ahead to find a feasible route to their destination. And Silas S. Smith headed for Salt Lake City to raise funds and locate necessary supplies. Anyone who wished to drop out could have gone back with him but no one did so. Week after week, the pioneers labored on the Hole in the Rock crevice and the terrain east of the river with nothing but hammers, chisels, and picks. By early January, there must have been great concern when the four scouts sent ahead were long overdue and there was no word of blasting powder. Meanwhile, deep snow was accumulating on the Escalante Mountains. On January 10th, the four scouts, Lemuel Red Sr., George Seavey, George Morrell, and George Hobbs returned. The scouts shared how Grand Gulch required a northern detour to higher elevations, where they became lost and ran out of food. Following ancient Anasazi Indian trails, the scouts were able to find a way through. They told about many more significant barriers that would have to be overcome before the pioneers could reach their destination. On January 26, the road down the crevice was completed and the pioneers began their harrowing descent. Elizabeth Decker. They went down like they would smash everything. I will never forget that day. It nearly scared me to death. Concerning the ferry crossing, Lafayette Guyman related that driving down the embankment and on to the ferry, it was perhaps the first time in his life that he would have handed the reins to someone else. When his wagon, provisions, and family were finally ferried safely across the torrent, Lafayette thought he was the most thankful that lived. 
East of the river, their road-building challenges included building a rock dugway up from the river's edge and into Cottonwood Canyon, the lower Cottonwood Hill dugway, the Sand Hill, the upper Cottonwood Hill dugway, the Little Hole in the Rock, Ribbon Canyon, the Chute, Slick Rocks, Death Valley, the Clay Hill Cliffs, and the pass through them. A detour around Grand Gulch, a thick juniper forest on Cedar Mesa. Finding a way down from Cedar Mesa. The Twist. Comb Ridge. San Juan Hill. And Butler Wash. On April 4th, 1880, the pioneers arrived in the Bluff Valley, one of the locations designated for the settlement. They had been en route for six months, nearly twice as long as it took some of the same pioneers to pull handcarts 1,300 miles to the Salt Lake Valley. The Heroes of the Trek As the men were off working on the road, the women met the needs of their families, caring for the children and seeing to the necessities of life as they camped in the wilderness. Some drove wagons. Two had babies en route, and one suffered the heartbreak of a miscarriage. The young women had a number of duties and assisted their mothers with camp chores. The young men took care of the cattle and had a variety of other duties. The men labored during all daylight hours, six days a week, hefting rocks, building massive dugways, drilling, picking, and blasting a way through. The children played, worked, and suffered along with everyone else through long winter nights and bitter temperatures. Some suffered from frostbite and much sickness was endured. The scouts plotted a path and traversed in and out of seemingly countless dead-end canyons until a route was found. The freighters, who brought the blasting powder and supplies over the snow-laden Escalante Mountains, if the details of their amazing feat were known, it would make for a great movie. The men of Escalante, who provided the skills and labor, to safely ferry the pioneers across the river. The animals stained the sandstone with blood from their forelegs as they struggled against the steep slopes and, in some cases, died along the way. Unity and Cooperation This was a journey of teamwork and cooperation. No barriers could be overcome by any one person. Even after a stretch of road was completed, a wagon and team could not be driven far without help. On the steepest slopes, animals had to be shared. Both Cottonwood Hill and San Juan Hill required 14 animals to pull one wagon. Human Jones, quote, In very rough places, men would rely on each other's help steadying the wagons down the slick rocks with long ropes and pushing and pulling up the hills. Later in her life, Eliza Ann Red was describing the challenges of the journey. Her daughter, Marion, asked her, Mother, how did you ever stand such hardships? Eliza's response was, Why, those were the happiest days of my life. The men and women of that party came to genuinely love each other. We were closely welded into one big family. Come, come, ye saints, no toil or labor fear, but with joy wend your way. Though hard to you this journey may appear, 
they shall be as your day. Sarah Williams, who at the time was not a member of their faith, came on the journey to help care for her sister's children. Quote, The unity among the people, coming out with no conveniences, and yet they were just as happy as they could be. I was deeply impressed with the love and actions of those with whom I traveled. In reaching Bluff, the San Juan pioneers had succeeded in opening a supply and access road across the territory that greatly reduced future travel time over any other possible route. The San Juan pioneers built much more than a wagon road. They built unity. They built qualities that come in no other way than through challenges and the determination to never give up. Perhaps they were developing just what they needed for their most formidable challenges which were yet before them. Thirteen years later, Remington W. Lane, an artist and reporter for the Harper's Weekly, accompanied an archaeological expedition from New York City to ancient ruins in the remote southeastern corner of the Utah Territory. Shortly after entering Utah, the explorers came across the community of Bluff. They were not expecting to find a town in such a rugged and inhospitable land. Is it possible in any fertile spot in Utah, no matter how remote from civilization, not to find a prosperous band of Mormons? I cannot imagine a finer example of Mormon enterprise than these 200 people, leaving their good homes and facing the dangers and hardships of an unknown country. From the oldest inhabitants, I learned that the founding of Bluff City was attended with greater suffering and more arduous labor than any other like scheme of colonization. I could scarcely realize the trials and struggles said to have been endured. Remington W. Lang, Harper's Weekly. I will conclude with two quotes. First, from David E. Miller, a professor of history who in the late 1950s compiled much of what we now know of the San Juan Pioneer's journey to Bluff in his book, Hole in the Rock. Quote, No pioneering company ever built a wagon road through wilder, rougher, more inhospitable country. None ever demonstrated more courage, faith, and devotion to cause. Cuban Jones. The good father had a kind watch care over the whole company of pilgrims, bringing us through without death or serious sickness or accident. Looking back on it now and considering how that large company worked and blasted their way through a country of that nature, and being there during six months of one of the severest winters, it looks to me as though there was something more than human power or wisdom associated with it.